So uh, now you come back. You you. I'm I'm fast forwarding to where you're now becoming a company. XO. I'm going to the book just after we deployed again in 2006. I was pulled from weapons company to become executive officer for India Company Three Two Marines. It happened so fast. I didn't have time to get to know my new Marines before we ended up in country again. We deployed to Al Ambar Province to a fob near Habania. And this was cool because you were in Habania and I was 20 miles away in Ramadi in in that summer of 2006. Next, my company lost four Marines killed. Lance Corporal Don Champ Champlin was our first. He was killed by a roadside bomb on the main road running through our area. That was the end of August of 2006. A month later, on the 24th, our company commander sent a platoon out after an insurgent who'd fired a rocket into one of our patrol bases. They'd gone out without a special device that blocked incoming cell phone signals and prevented insurgents from remotely detonating IEDs. Sure enough, the platoon got hit with a bomb. Blew Lance Corporal Rene Martinez 70 meters into the air. He died instantly. That one really hurt. I'd been on the base at the time. I took great pride in going out on patrols, not to ride herd on the platoon commanders, but to be there as an additional asset and to share the risks with my Marines. This time I'd been tied up and couldn't get out there with the men. When I heard what was happening, I grabbed a Humvee and raced to the scene. We carried Rene back to the morgue. Inside, I stood next to him, held his hand, and said my goodbyes. I will carry the guilt of that day for the rest of my life. I should have been out there with that platoon. We kept taking casualties that fall. Even units just passing through our area got hit. One EOD rig got hit with a roadside bomb. Though the blast didn't destroy the armored Humvee, it set off a couple Phosphorus-based incendiary grenades the EOD team had left on the floor of their rig. Before we could even get to them, the white-hot chemical fire melted them where they sat. The sight was indescribable. After that scene, morale in the company plummeted. The men questioned the mission. What was the point? We were getting shot at almost every day. Going into Habania to patrol was a daily nightmare of snipers, bombs, and ambushes. Half the time, we couldn't even fire back. The rules of engagement were so strict that if civilians were in the area, we could not engage the enemy. Since there were almost always civilians in the area, our Marines had to show incredible restraint even as they watched their brothers die. So you guys were wrapped. That that ROE ROE was tight. It was tough. I mean, it was... Habania had never been patrolled before. They had set up patrol bases, but they had never gone out and walked around. And, and they had, you know, the, the outgoing unit said, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. But you had to. Yeah, you the had only to. way, the only way to defeat that enemy was to suffocate the area. And what mattered most were the people. If the people trusted us, they would feed us the information so we could capture the enemy. If the people trusted them because we wouldn't patrol and we were scared, then they would trust them and we would end up, we would end up not accomplishing our mission and it was it was so hard you know people have this idea that because you wear a certain rank everybody's going to (laughs) listen or it's hardcore leadership and and they're not going to ask questions you know when i would go patrol base to patrol base and speak to my men and they would ask why why should i walk out there tomorrow you know we don't have CNN and and this general or the president talking to us, giving us this big, huge, hey, here's the ultimate game plan. Or we're, we don't get any of that. I mean, my guys were showering once every 17, 18 days. That's it. We were living amongst the populace, amongst the enemy that was traveling all around the country coming in and, 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 and attacking us. And so it got really difficult. But the, the one thing that, that stuck with them, that they could understand, that at their perspective they got was, hey, look, if you quit on me, that's one less guy to man the post on top of this patrol base to keep this roadway clear. That's one less guy guarding Mikey's flank when you go on patrol and you've got three patrols tomorrow. We were already so thin at that time. Our battle space was way too big for us to truly suffocate it to make sure the enemy couldn't, couldn't come in and influence. Way too big. But as we got better, 
as we secured the area and we focused really on the main supply route and the economic parts of that, the shops, if we could secure the shops and secure the schools, because the kids couldn't go to school and the kids tried to go to school, Al Qaeda killed the teachers. So now we secured the area enough that the two schools could open. When we were able to do that, then the shops opened up and the people could start living their lives again. That was one of the proudest days of my Marines' lives when those kids could walk to school again. These schools were corners blown up from IEDs, bullet holes in them. There were no roofs. I mean, they were, by our standards in America, you wouldn't be able to fathom what these looked like. They were basically concrete squares with, with really bad desks in them. The school supplies they had were given to them from us. And so that was a huge win for us. And at that time, it was right around the same time of the surge. And when the surge took place, what happened was two Iraqi companies pushed west and were able to take up a quarter of our battle space, which then greatly allowed us. Now, now we've got enough people. Now we can really influence it. What happened with the Iraqi people is we would sit down and have dinner with them and bring them gifts and talk to them. I'd have meetings with them at two in the morning when they felt comfortable to speak to me. Now they're telling me who, where, what time, where can we get them? And when you've got Marines questioning the mission, then all of a sudden you deliver them some intel and say, hey, at 3 a.m., you're going to go find this person at this spot. This is what they look like. This is what they're called. Get them. And then they get excited. And I don't mean get them as in terms of, hey, they're going to go and they're, they're going to go kill that person. They're going to go capture them. And we had a whole process, a whole very frustrating. You had to literally now, now my Marines are no longer infantrymen. Now they're also detectives. All right. So this is the intel package that led to this detention. Here's the paperwork for the detention. We deliver them to the detention center. If you don't hit every wicket right, that person's back on the streets in three days. So that was also detailed discipline and doing all the right things, but they did it. And I tell you, Ramadi, Habaniya, they were some of the worst areas in Iraq that fall. By Christmas time, yeah. it was amazing, the turnaround. It was incredible. They were quiet. Yep. They were quiet. It was, it was you know. I left, I left October 21st, 2006. There was 30 to 50 enemy attacks a day while I was in deployment that six months. By January... There was like one or two enemy attacks a day, down from thirty to fifty. It was boom. It was incredible, incredible. Unbelievable. We, we left in February, February two thousand seven. In in speaking of coming home, Third Battalion, Second Marines came home in two thousand seven after suffering fifteen killed in action. It could have been far worse for all of us if we hadn't seen any progress in Habania. That's what you're talking about. Then all those questions we had over the mission and its value would have returned home to term- torment us for years to come. In fact, we did see progress, and that made it a little easier to accept things. And um, yeah, that's that's basically what you just said. And and it, that's why you know you and I were talking about this on the way over as. As nice as it was that we got to see that happen, there was nothing more sickening to me than to have eight years later have the the black flag of ISIS flying over the city of Ramadi at the government center. That that it was just absolutely heinous to see that it didn't need to happen. And you know, they actually took Ramadi back again through massive airstrike. And I was talking to one of my buddies that that was a JTAC that's actually coming on the podcast, Marine Corps JTAC that, that I was talking to you about mm-hmm. earlier. But he's, I was like, how many bombs did we drop in Ramadi while we were there? Because it was a populous city. There was normal Iraqis that wanted to live their lives. We weren't dropping bombs. He was like, I don't know, maybe a dozen, 15 in the second push in Ramadi that the Iraqis just did behind the strength of American firepower, you know how many air missions they did? They did 600 strike missions. <laughs> hey, have you seen pictures of Ramadi right now? Rubble. It's rubble. Now they're rebuilding it now, but it was just 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 rubble. And um, yeah, just it's so disheartening. Um, so you come home from that deployment and. It was pretty quickly after you got you got home that Travis got killed. Yeah, and you know I wanted to give a little credit here to the MIT teams because Travis was a MIT team, uh, which is military transition team. 
which was, okay, so I, I talk about this sometimes, right? So the SEALs and the special operations guys, a lot of times we live in relative comfort. Okay, so we live like, okay, we're pretty comfortable. You know, like I said, I had mats on deployment. Mm -hmm. I brought a GP medium tent to put mats in because <laughs> I got to train some jujitsu. We have a nice weight room, you know, we and, and SEALs are super aggressive and crafty and figuring out like, okay, what can we do? How can we get this? We'll contractors and ordering stuff. And so we just make, we, we do a good job of building our infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, I mean some, some comforts come with that, right? Now you go to the conventionals, take a step down because they're not getting as much leeway, they don't have as much, uh, they can't get away with as much, so they're living maybe a little bit harder, maybe even a lot harder than, and of course, hey, by the way, there's special operations guys that are living out in the sticks in Afghanistan with two of them, with you know 280 tribesmen, so I'm, I'm saying, I'm talking about my particular situation, which my particular situation was, in Iraq when I deployed there, we always lived good, always lived good. Conventionals? We'd go out to their outstations. We'd stop on a way to a mission. We'd stop by someone, you know, stop by wherever, some cop somewhere or some fob somewhere. Those guys are living rough. And I had SEALs. My SEALs that lived in Corregidor, they were living rough. But my point is, you go one step further, <laughs> and now you get to what's called a MIT team. Yeah. And the MIT teams are embedded with Iraqi troops. And so they are living with Iraqi troops. There might be two, three, maybe four of them. And they're out there living with the Iraqi troops, counting on the security of the Iraqi forces to protect them. And I mean, it was horrible. When we first got to Ramadi, there was a, there was a VBIED attack that killed the oncoming MIT team commander and the outgoing MIT team commander. They were doing a turnover oh. at a station and uh, VBIED came, killed them both, wounded a bunch, but it's interesting because I didn't know Travis was a supply officer in the Marine Corps. And so so the the Marine Corps has this way of selecting where you where you get what you get to be in the Marine Corps as an officer. They take the class and chunk it up into thirds. And then the the each top third you get a pick and it goes down the list. So that way they don't have every single guy, all the best guys, quote unquote, going to be Marine Corps infantry or going to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. You you might be you might be the bottom the top of the bottom third in the class and you get your pick. Mm -hmm. So you don't. It doesn't matter how you perform. I mean, it matters, yeah. but out it, of a class of over two hundred, Travis mm -hmm. was seventeen in his class at the basic school, which is a very prestigious. To, be, to graduate in the top twenty-five is incredible. Yeah, and he got his third choice. His third. He's a logistics officer. He was furious. So he's angry, and then and the Marine Corps did this very very well they understood the importance of the mitt team so they really took great guys and sent them to the mitt teams and he so they they put up volunteers hey who wants who wants to raise your hand and go live amongst the Iraqis counting on them for security training them working with them eating their crappy food living without air conditioning I mean, it just sucks it it's just awful. sucks it's awful. awful of course what does Travis do oh, I'm game oh yeah <laughs> let's do this so he went, and uh, obviously he was he was he was killed in action. He was killed in action during a firefight, trying to like you just talked about. wasn't trying to save other Marines. He was trying to save his fellow Iraqi soldiers. And just like you just said, there's so many people that don't understand how closely we worked with Iraqi soldiers and how committed we were with helping them. So that's a classic example. And by the way, that, that eulogy that he wrote for himself was this. Travis Mannion was a man unafraid to stand for what was right. I think that's something that anybody could aspire towards and, and actually another, you know, you talked about the connections earlier. Well, there's a connection here that Travis's roommate in the Naval Academy was a guy by the name of Brendan Looney who did what you talked about, the painful way of getting to the SEAL teams. Yep. He went to the surface warfare community, then he got picked up for the SEAL teams, went through SEAL training, and he was also killed in Afghanistan in 21 September. 2010.